Praise the Lord, everyone. So good to be in the house of the Lord today. We have a very special day planned. We have uh, we have uh, some wonderful friends of ours, uh, the Sullys here, missionaries. Uh, that is uh, uh, just doing a wonderful job. A lot of good things that we're going to hear about, and we're excited about that. Also, have the baptismal tank filled, and. Uh, of service, so we'll be concluding with that, so that's exciting time, exciting things, so, uh, so we know that God's going to do something great. Open your heart, open your mind, why don't we just stand and open our hands up towards heaven and just welcome the Lord in this place right now. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we magnify you, Jesus, we exalt your wonderful name, we ask you, God, to touch our hearts, touch our minds, minister, oh God, to our spirits, for we give you glory and honor and praise this day.
I can come into his house knowing assured, assured that he's going to meet us here. Yeah. Yeah. We dedicated this to his name. This is his house. So therefore, if no one else shows up, we know this. We can walk into here all by ourselves. And we are not alone because when we walk into a place that we dedicated to his name, we know this. We won't be alone because he's famous for this house. He's famous for meeting us in this place. This is going to be what he desires, touching our lives, ministering to our hearts. There is no telling today who today is going to walk out with a special touch and a special blessing. Heaven sent into their life because God says today is the day I'm going to rain down on you and pour out my mercy and grace. Amen. We want to go to the Lord in prayer today. We know that we have many needs and there is families that um, has, uh, has been affected a little bit more in the last uh, two or three weeks and it's uh, one of those things that uh, we're happy to be back in church and be celebrating uh, together again. Um, I am uh, grateful for every name that has been turned in because that means that we're still believing God is our healer. And we still believe we make our request to Him. He's able. We trust Him to work in our lives. So today, I want you, if you have a need today, whatever it is, how, however big, however small, Give it to God, and as we turn over these requests to Him, we ask the Lord to minister. He wants to touch you too. Amen. Let's join together in faith and believing. Lord, we love you, and we thank you, God. We come to you right now, Lord, in behalf, Lord, of our church, our church family. We want you, God, to minister and touch. We want you, God, to touch their lives in a special way. Lord, we know that you are able. We trust you, God, to work a great work. We know, Lord, that you are wanting to show yourself strong. Right now, Lord, we have requests. We have requests of healing, Lord, and declaring your name right now. We know you are our healer. We know, God, that you are wanting to move. We know, God, that you are wanting to touch. We pray that your blood, oh Lord, would be applied. That, Lord Jesus, you would let mercy and grace be found in every home. Lord, right now, we ask you, God, to touch those that are despondent, those, oh Lord, that may be away, those, oh God, that they need a special touch from you. Touch the brokenhearted right now, God, and minister to their spirit. Lord, I pray you would wrap your arms around them. Help them to know just how much you love them. Help them to know, God, right now, that you give, Lord, everything for them. And, Lord, you want them to be blessed by you. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. And thank you for what you're going to do. We believe you, Lord, for a wonderful, wonderful work. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we just give the Lord a praise and thanksgiving. Believing, Lord, you're going to do it. Believing, Lord, you're going to minister. Believing, Lord, you're going to do the miraculous. You're our healer. You're our helper. You're our refuge. We bless your wonderful name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Right now, brother... Uh, Brother Seth is coming. Some of the, the youth, uh, you may be seated for a moment. Amen. Exciting things happened this uh, this weekend. Our, our young people went down uh, down a little bit southern, not as much southern as it's been in the past, so we're pretty grateful. Amen. Amen. Let's get an update. Amen. So, AYC was this weekend. I pause for a fact. So we had a great trip. Uh, real quick, uh, I do want to say thank you to a couple of really important people, and then we're going to have two young people testify about the trip. So before we see what God did at the trip, I do want to say thank you to Sister Benton and Sister Yvonne for handling some of the, the administrative stuff on gathering some funds and booking some hotel rooms. Thank you guys very much. And we, the, the four chaperones we had, Amber, Sister Lexi, Brother Jay, and Sister Emily, y'all were a tremendous help. But parents, I want you to be encouraged at the fact that your kids were the best behaved at this conference. Yeah. Right. They were the best behaved at this conference, but they were also leaders in worship at this conference. And moseying into a time of praise and worship, it was the LifeGate kids that happened to be down there first. It was the LifeGate kids that were praying with other people, making sure that they weren't going along. So we celebrate a lot today. We have a baptism that's happening later. We had somebody receive the Holy Ghost at AYC. That's very exciting. 
that's just the beginning. These young people are awesome. I love working with these young people. And watching them grow spiritually is something incredible to witness. So at this time, we're going to have Brother Jared and Sister Lissy uh, come to the platform, please. And just know that the, the cost that the parents spent on this trip was just a little bit of monetary cost for what God can do in the lives of these yeah. young people. Yeah. And we're going to continue, on, on the youth side, we're going to continue working to, to lower those costs of fundraising and things so we can continue to go to these things because we know that God has something in store for these young yeah. people. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So AYC was a great experience, as usual. It's an excellent experience for everybody to go and experience the word of the Lord. So Saturday, Friday night, Brother and Reverend, or Reverend Gore uh, preached to us. He, brought, he preached the, the storm on the way to the storm. He was talking to us about how the disciples and Jesus were getting ready to sail to the Sea of Galilee to the man of the Gatherings. And he said that the disciples were already most likely annoyed with Jesus at that time because they were local fishermen and they were used to shallow waters, but they were fearful of the deep. So they most likely could have just walked around the land and went to manna gatherings on land instead of having to go to the sea. But during that, as the Bible says, there was a storm and Jesus was sleeping and he came up and calmed the storms, but Reverend Gore said that the manna gatherings most likely he was able to see Jesus when he came up from the boat and see how he calmed the storms. And when Jesus and the disciples landed, the man of the gatherings came and fell on his knees beneath Jesus because he knew that if Jesus could calm a storm outside in the weather, he could calm a storm on the inside. So that really, that really touched me and I felt really great about that. Thank you. to uh, LW conference this year, and uh, I've been previous years, but I have to say that this one touched my heart mainly, because I got to also witness um, one of our own receive the Holy Ghost, and I was very thankful for that opportunity to see them receiving it and open up to God and allow Him to go. I also got the um, ability to see several others worship in ways that they had never worshipped before, some were running, some were jumping, some were dancing, and some were just out in the spirit. And it was amazing and beautiful. I have to say that um, Saturday morning, um, Reverend Gore um, spoke on uh, not taking anything back with you, not letting the stealer steal from you anymore, from anything. From He had talked about multiple different subjects that not only us as youth go through, but also as adults and children um, have to go through as well. And I was very privileged to be able to hear that first and foremost, and I'm very thankful for the experience. Thank you. So with all, with all that being said, sorry, with all that being said, why don't we go ahead and stand to our feet? We're going to sing one more song before we have the ministry above the Sully this, this afternoon. But we can just go ahead and worship God today. We, we wanted to testify a little bit about AYC because we want the parents to know y'all weren't there so you don't get to experience what these, these young people did. But hearing from them directly, knowing that they heard the word like that, should touch our hearts in the fact that they hear it here too. Right. The actions that, that are going on in these church services are impacting our young people and they can impact us as adults as well. So let's let's just move into a time of worship before we hear the word this afternoon and just begin to prepare our hearts for what God has in store today. Thank you, Jesus.
our refuge. He is our help. He's going to be with us every step of the way. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. What an awesome, awesome presence of the Lord we feel here today. We are so very grateful for His, His response. Notice how I put that? His response to your worship. His response. Amen, amen, amen. God is so very good. So we were uh, uh, speaking of several things here, and we have we have actually said a few times that we've uh, um, going to have a, a baptism. And that's Sister Penelope over here. She, she is uh, one of four for this 2021 to receive the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We add in and we are celebrating today with Sister Kimmy. We're coming back to the youth conference. Hallelujah. Excited and, uh, and filled with God's presence and power. Nothing like it experiencing the power of God in your life. I'm not exactly sure how someone can can uh, can live being a Christian, quote unquote, and not experience the presence of God in their life. Because his presence and his power is the refreshing that is spoken of in Acts. We come in here from the doldrums of the week and everything that's happened. We come through here and we begin to exalt his name and he just begins to refresh, restore our spirits and touch our lives. Otherwise, man, we just walk back out with the same, same baggage, same things that we face. But man, it is so refreshing to walk in here and feel the renewing power of God's spirit in our lives. And I thank him today for his presence, his power, and his love for us. Amen, amen, amen. Right now, our Sunday school is going to be dismissed. I know today's a special day. I also know all the things that's been happening. We have not had Sunday school very much, and so we want our children to have a, uh, have a good time in, in Sunday school today. And uh, remember, at our conclusion, don't, don't run jetting out the door. We're going to come back in here for baptismal service. And, uh, and uh, we're going to let God uh, continue to touch hearts and minds. We are so excited today to have with us uh, Brother Craig and uh, Sister Lene Sully. And uh, they are uh, awesome folks and uh, friends of ours, very uh, dear friends, knowing that uh, they are Alabamans, that uh, they are, uh, are are over in the wild blue yonder, but they're from here, and it's good having uh, home folks from a long way away. Amen. Uh, and from the southern to come, bless our congregation. We love you guys. We appreciate it. Let's come put our hands together and clap unto the Lord Jesus Christ and give Him praise and glory and honor. In this house, He really is worthy of that praise. There's a story told of a, of a man who was habitually late for church. I know that would never happen here. But uh, finally, one day after habitually arriving church for a long time, somebody politely confronted him about it and his response was, well, I got here in time for the preaching and that's the most important part of the service. To which the reply was, it might be the most important part of the service for you, but it wasn't the most important part of the service to God. When, when we hear the preaching, God excuse the, the, the term, but God doesn't hear anything he hadn't heard before. But when we begin to open our mouths and praise and worship to the living God, there's something about the Lord. He turns his ear like that, and it's as if he's hearing your voice for the very first time, lifting up and praising his name. Why don't we do that one more time in this place? You're so good to your people. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the 
of the Lamb. You may be seated in the wonderful name of the Lord. It is great to be in church this morning. And uh, we are so thankful to be here with you in Madison. And uh, appreciate our friends, the Pentons, and uh, the wonderful opportunity that we have to be together with them. And we have known them for quite a few years, and our wives have enjoyed some special time together this week. And uh, they disappeared all day during this week, and I, I managed to get some work done, and uh, it, it was just a good time for all. And uh, we appreciate their friendship. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were happened to be home. We came through the building. Uh, it didn't look anything at all like this, but uh, we were so thrilled to see the growth at LifeGate and what God was doing for the church family here. And so we just rejoice with you as the progress continues. And who knows, by the time we get back the next time, maybe this wall will be gone. And we'll have had so much growth here that we'll just need about double the space just for the worship and the praise. I hope you think that will be all right. And also to be with some uh, dear friends of our family, especially my wife's side of the family. And, uh, well, they're, they're family. Yes, I'm so. <laughs> Someone getting correction. That never happens with Brother Patton, but my wife breaks. <laughs> but the Testons, who have been lifelong family, and uh, my wife actually got to spend some time with Sister Testin this week also. I was in an online meeting, could not get there. I, I apologize so much. Yeah. But uh, wonderful to be with you and your family has been a blessing, uh, both in times of rejoicing and some of the, the valleys that we've been through. The family of the Testins has been there for us. And so we just give God praise and glory for that. Amen. Since 1987, and uh, Jason, you can help me out here now, uh, we've been involved in missions work in uh, West Africa, and we began in Nigeria. You can maybe find some of these places on that map, but uh, working there. Finally, we arrived a little more than four years ago in Senegal, the capital city of Dakar, to plant a church in that nation of over 15 million people, predominantly French-speaking, predominantly Muslim in faith. It is a very difficult region, but the reason why we went there was not because it was easy. It's because uh, whether it is easy or difficult, every soul in that nation needs to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we began. Uh, shortly after arrival, looking for opportunities to preach the word, looking for opportunities to pray with people, and looking for opportunities uh, to uh, uh, share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, after being there for uh, close to nine months, we were able to find a location and begin services. And uh, I want my wife to share a little bit with you about what it was like to begin a brand new church in a brand new country for the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an honor to be here. Uh, Change gears on me. I got in the wrong lane. <laughs> but God is good. We arrived in December of 2006, actually Christmas Eve. 16. Day. 16, yes. It feels like since 2006. <laughs> because so much has happened. <laughs> but God is, God is good. We arrived there on the tarmac in Dakar, Senegal. And um, it was a different arrival. There was no one there to meet us. There was no one there to welcome us. There was no one there to say, we've got Christmas Eve dinner ready. Come on. Wash your face and eat. As far as we knew, we were the only, the only oneness apostolic, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, souls in that entire nation. And if you never, I know some are military background, if you never arrived in an area where there was no one that knew anything about Jesus, you will not understand that feeling. But if you have, you understand just a little bit of what we felt. And so we got there, there was nothing. And so where do you start? What do you do? 
And so we did the only thing we knew to do, getting our Shoes for Christ vehicle that we had went and purchased and had to explain why we were there to purchase the vehicle. And began driving around the city and praying. When we went to buy our fridge and our stove that the ladies so wonderfully provide for us. Well, why do you need a stove? The door opened. And so we began to meet people and we began to share with them what God had done for us and why we were there. And it was, it was exciting. We finally, after several, several months, um, began to hold our first service. And we were excited. We had a little bitty tiny space, little, little, the drum area, <laughs> maybe add the organ in, and there was one lady, her two children, and my husband and myself, and that was it, and I was excited because I was going to get to have Sunday school, and then I realized that that eight-year-old little girl and the two-year-old little boy really didn't know anything about Jesus. Even though they had somewhat of a Christian background, they knew who Mary and Joseph and, and baby Jesus was, but that was about it. And so we began to build a foundation on the Word of God. We began to teach them to read their Bibles. We handed Bibles out left, right, and center. Anybody that come to church, they got a Bible, whether they wanted it or not, because they didn't have one. And how can you tell somebody about Jesus if they don't even have anything that they can read? How can you preach them if they don't have anything? And so we begin to teach them to daily read the Word of God. And it was exciting with our kids because they were learning to read. Some couldn't read, but they would listen. And they are now on their fourth time through of reading the entire Bible. I won't ask how many of you adults have read the entire Bible through in the last year, but our kids are reading the Word of God and they're growing, and I'm so excited. We also begin then having Club Day Make Calls, which is our vacation Bible school, and that was exciting because we had children from all different backgrounds come to our vacation Bible school. They didn't have a clue what it was, but they knew they were going to play games, and they were going to do art, and they were going to eat. And the eating was a big draw. And so they brought them in. They come in. We've had up to 30 in there. We now have in our service a lady and her son that are a result of that vacation Bible school. They're coming regularly. And I believe they're going to receive the Holy Ghost to be baptized very soon. The most exciting thing of all is that little eight-year-old girl that was my first Sunday school student. We started with her mom and her and her brother and us. Five, six. I think we had an angler with us. Six people. And now we average 25 to 30 every Sunday. Awesome. And this picture is that little girl. And that's the day she was baptized in Jesus' name. And she has sent and seen the gift of the Holy Ghost. We give God all the glory to God. We give all of Him. We give all of Jesus. Would you stand with us this morning? If you had attended our church at the Car Senegal, we would have lifted up the name of Jesus Christ, probably both in French and English. And it would have sounded a little bit like this. May shade breeze
wonderful name of the Lord. Now, having begun a work in the nation of Senegal, we continue to believe that God is going to pour out His Spirit and give us a great revival in that nation. We also are working in some of the surrounding areas. Uh, recently, we were able to go into uh, the nation of the Gambia, which is a small English-speaking nation that is entirely surrounded by Senegal and uh, have seen some great results there. We'll share just a little bit of that with you in a moment. We also work in what are commonly referred to as access challenge regions. These would be areas where it would be illegal to preach the gospel. It would be illegal to convert to Christianity. It would even be illegal to own a Bible. I hope you're thankful for a Bible. Amen. How many brought a Bible with you this morning? Uh-oh. Anybody bring a Bible with them to church this morning? Amen. You, you will never, I'm not condemning anybody, by the way, but I'm just point of reference. You will never see a Muslim carry his iPad to the mosque. He carries the book. Amen. Just say it. And, and, and that could be handy. Just yesterday I broke my phone. And suddenly it, it created problems for me. But we have seen God do some amazing things in the Access Challenge areas where we are working. And in spite of the fact that you can't preach, you can't teach, you can't lift up the name of Jesus, I'm thankful that in the area where we are working, we have people baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. God is doing an amazing work in our region of Africa where just uh, a little more than six years ago, we could count uh, up to a half a dozen nations that did not have an established church. And today in that region, not only because of our efforts, but also some others that are working there, notably some regional missionaries that have come from Brazil to work in the Portuguese nations that are connected with Senegal. We now have established churches in all but one of those nations. Yeah. And we're rejoicing with God that He has just opened up some amazing doors of opportunity. And we're just going to believe God that it is going to continue. And uh, we want to share with you uh, our first baptism in Senegal. Praise God. This is in the Gambia. This is a pastor. We baptize about uh, 15 to 20 pastors, pastors' wives. This is our first pastor baptized in the Gambia. And this is the baptism of that sister you saw, whose daughter was also baptized. Sister Lina, selon la de la parole de Dieu. Et à cause de votre obéissance à la foi et l'évangile de Jésus-Christ, je vous baptise maintenant au nom de Jésus-Christ pour le pardon de vos péchés. Merci, Et bien sûr, s'il y a quelqu'un d'autre qui veut le baptiser au nom de Jésus, l'eau est là. And what I said at the end was that if there's anyone else that would like to be baptized in Jesus' name, here is water. What the hinder? I'm excited we're going to baptize someone today in Jesus' name. But it's not only about baptizing people. It is about getting the word into their lives, whatever form that it takes. During the last four years, we printed over 250,000 pages in our printing equipment, and that has gone to produce tracts, it has gone to produce Bible school literature, books, uh, I have an example uh, of a book that we produce there, both in English and French, there's a copy on the table, unfortunately not for sale, but we produce these, and on that table there's a box, and on your way out, if you want to drop some change into that box, you're going to help us produce this literature that is impacting literally nations with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're excited that uh, people have come to help us. And we would even encourage you to see yourself. 
in Senegal. We'd love to have the pants come for a visit. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, I feel something. <laughs> how, many, how many would like them to come to Senegal and preach for us? <laughs> Amen. Thank the Lord. On that table, as I mentioned, uh, we do want you to stop by. If you have any change, uh, we can literally produce some of our tracks for a penny or less. And so there is nothing that you could put in that box outside of maybe the lint that's in your pocket uh, that wouldn't help us to produce literature to impact souls. We also, as my wife mentioned, distribute Bibles. And uh, about $10 or so can get a Bible in the hands of uh, somebody. We give them to everybody. As my wife mentioned, uh, the, la the Muslim lady that pumps my gas every time I need gas, she's got a Bible. Uh, if I meet somebody, uh, I'll talk to them first and get their permission because... A lot of people are offended if you try to give them a Bible where we work. Uh, just recently, I had a couple guys walking in uh, to our apartment where we live. They're working on one of my printing machines. And uh, I offered them a Bible, and they said, no, we're Muslim. We can't take a Bible. I said, but the Quran teaches that you should read the Bible and the Quran. Oh, then give us a Bible. <laughs> It's that easy. And, and, and they'll devour it. They'll read it. Uh, please, and, and can I just put a little advertisement in for evangelism? Don't be afraid of people. Right. 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 Don't be afraid of people because they think different than you and they right. act different than you and look different, even believe things different than you. Right. If you'll just love them, if you'll be their friend, if you'll just reach out in compassion instead of turning your back on them. You, you, you will be surprised how many open doors will come. Uh, because we are a brand new work, we do have a tremendous need to establish our first campus in that country. And uh, Dakar, Senegal is an amazing city where land is a premium. And it is going to cost us probably close to $100,000 just to get a piece of land. And that the same amount just to get a, a building established with potential for future growth. And... Uh, Perhaps there's someone here who happens to have $200,000 available to them. And if you are here this morning, please have a meeting with Pastor and I after service, and we will give you all the information you need to get that my way. But if you are not so blessed, you can probably still help us with this project. After all, uh, Uncle Joe might send more stimulus soon. <laughs> And after you paid your tithes on that, <laughs> perhaps you really don't need all that stimulus and you could forward some of it to help us get our first place of worship. We've been renting and that works well, but it really isn't an effective way to grow a church. We need a training facility. We need a building where we can gather together and even a place where people from access challenge regions can come safely to be taught, read, and study the Word of God. And when we do bring them out of the area, they will literally sit for hours with a Bible in front of them, sometimes with headphones, so that they can hear and memorize as much of the Word as possible, knowing that when they go back home, they literally are the only Bible that's going to get into that country. Amen. But that's what we want to do, and we want your help if you can do it. Thank you so much for supporting us over the years with a partner mission, and that monthly support really makes a difference to us. Thank you also for She's for Christ, all the youth that raise funny, for Move the Mission, I believe it is now called. Thank you. Uh, the ladies, as my wife mentioned, that provide appliances. Thank you so much for all of that. We do this together as a family. We do this together as one church, reaching one world with one God. Gospel, baptizing them in one name, into one faith, and one body of Jesus Christ. Would you stand together with me in the presence of the Lord? And uh, it truly is an honor to be with you in Madison. What a beautiful part of the country, North Alabama. Uh, this is our first time to really spend any length of time here and uh, just marveling at uh, all that is happening here, not only spiritually, but the beauty. Uh, yesterday I was out uh, north of Athens on my bicycle. It was freezing cold, but I really enjoyed uh, the sights and sounds that are in this part 
of your state. Amen. We're going to go to the word of the Lord, and I hope that your heart is open to the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that you are ready to hear something from God. Yes. Amen. Yeah. I, I don't do uh, what we do simply to put in the time. I believe God has a word for, for us today. Amen. And uh, if you will open up your heart, perhaps God will speak directly to you. John chapter 20, and we're going to read a number of verses and I am not going to preach necessarily a missions message, but I am going to try to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost here today. Amen. John chapter 20, verses 24 through 27, and we read, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. This is after the resurrection of the Lord. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, there's always one, isn't there? <laughs> Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. From this text, I'm going to preach on a one-word subject, and hopefully you will understand by the time we're done, but I'm going to preach on scars. Would you pray with me this morning? Let's just ask the Holy Ghost to minister in our hearts and lives. Would you lift up your voice and your hands to the Lord Jesus? I love you today. I'm thankful for your spirit. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be in your presence here today. I'm thankful, oh God, that you have brought us together for such a time as this. Lord, I'm praying that you would minister with your word and your spirit, that your will would be done, that in all things you would be given the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we ask. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the wonderful name of the Lord. When I ponder the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and our personal future resurrection, I hope you will agree with me that resurrection is a wonderful and powerful thing. To think that one moment we will be either walking on this earth or perhaps having been buried prior to that. One moment we will be there and instantaneously in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the trumpet, we shall be changed. Right. And we shall be caught up together to be with the Lord and we shall live with him forever. I look at the resurrection of Jesus and I understand there was amazing transformation that happened to him. His whole nature was changed to such a matter that he was literally able from our understanding of the texts, he was literally able to walk through walls. In his ascension, he literally defied gravity. He ate with his disciples food, possessing a body that no longer needed food. Right. These are, these are things, I want to figure all this out one day, but it'll probably be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, and even then, you and I were going to eat and, and yet not need food to live. Right. Come on. We're just going to live. And I don't think we can really understand the, the potential that lies within us. You have the seed of the Spirit living in, inside of you. And the same Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead also lives in you. And that's the Spirit that's going to quicken your mortal body. And instantaneously, you shall be changed. All right. But even 
the disciples and many of the religious scholars of Jesus' day didn't understand. That's why they would ask these strange questions about whose husband is going to get whose wife and, and all of those things because they, they didn't understand. Jesus had to correct them, correct them saying, you don't understand what the resurrection is really like. And I don't think our uh, minds and our thoughts can even perceive because what is sown and put in the ground according to the scriptures is not going to be the same as what comes out. Come on. Amen. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 37 and 38, it says this, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. And that's a little hard King James English to understand, but basically what Paul was trying to communicate is that anybody who's ever worked on a farm knows that the seed you put in the ground doesn't look like the plant that comes out. Right. Now, it will ultimately produce the same seed, but that seed, you cannot just take a random seed. And if I were to put in your hand a seed that you did not recognize, chances are you will not be able to describe what that's, if I were to put a, an apple seed in the hands of many of the African brothers and sisters I go to church with and, and, and say, tell me, what's that going to produce? They would scratch their head and they would come up with a good guess about what it might be or might not be. Probably going to be wrong. Because you can't determine the plant by simply looking at the seed. Right. It's just radically different. A, a, a mustard seed, according to the teaching of the scripture, can produce a tree so great that the birds of the heaven will lodge in it. Come on. And yet it's the smallest of seeds. So, so, so don't go looking at this flesh and don't go considering this life to try to think. It's just going to be better. Oh. You can think about streets of gold and gates of... It's going to be better. Right. You get to think about walking with Jesus and being around the throne of Jesus. It's going to be better, Brother yeah. Tester, than all of that. As, as wonderful and glorious as it's going to be, it's just going to be better. Right. Yet when I look at the resurrection of Jesus, there is this thing that eats me up, this anomaly. His scars. That's right. You would think Perhaps, at least according to the way this guy thinks, that would it have not been really cool just to bring about a resurrected body that was complete with perfect healing of the wounds? Amen. That would have been wonderful. And what a testimony of the power of God. And what a testimony of the, the absolute defeat of death, hell, and the grave, and the enemies of the cross, and the enemies of Christ. It was well within the power of God, I believe, to restore every cell and every tissue of that body to its original condition. Right. And I would even beg to ask the question, would the resurrection perhaps not have even more, been more glorious without the scars? Come on, come on. And in fact, in the eyes of the multitude, probably would have been better. And, and as we look at the 12 disciples, we discover that none of them even cared. Right. Except one. That's the truth. The others were convinced. They didn't ask for any proof like Thomas. And we know him as doubting Thomas. But if it had not been for Thomas, we would have lost out on this understanding. Because of his inquisitiveness. Because of his question. Because of his persistence. I really want to be convinced. And here's the proof I need. Without Thomas, we wouldn't even know about this. That's the truth. It was a moot point for everyone else, but, but Thomas said, I, I, I want to see the scars. There's, there's a, a group of people, and I pray, I sincerely pray, that they are not represented here in this place. But there's a chance that in a past life and a past 
circumstance that statistically you could be here. There are a group of people that are referred to by psychologists and others as cutters. You may not be aware of this, it can be young people, but it can be adults who are dealing with psychological trauma, trauma, pain, difficulty in their body, circumstances they don't understand, and the only avenue they, they have to deal with the, the emotional pain is to inflict themselves with physical pain. And they will literally cut themselves, different parts of their body. But what's interesting about cutters is that you would never know. And, and I'm not pointing anybody out here. I'm just telling you, you probably never know. You could be sitting beside somebody. And I pray you're not, but you could be sitting beside somebody that suffers from this particular emotional trauma and, and, and is a victim of this. I was shocked. My wife was telling me this just yesterday that on, on a forum of ladies ministers that uh, a pastor's child, no names involved, but, but had been sent for counseling and the counselor actually recommended to the child to do this. Is that not true? Why did I hear? I just scratch my head. But the thing about cutters is that if they are one, you will never see the scars. They're hidden. But that's not what Jesus did. Right. You want to see them? Here they are. This was a sign of all of his past hurts. This was evidence of all the wrongs that had been done against him. Right. This was proof of every false accusation that had been spoken about him. This was proof of the, the betrayal of one who was supposed to be amongst his closest friends. This was evidence that he came unto his own and his own received him not. Right. Amen. He still has these scars. And when he returns, according to Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 6, he's still going to have the scars in his glorious return. Because the Jews will ask him, where did you get these wounds that are in your head? He will say, these are they which I received in the house of my friend. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. And, and, and so... Think about this. In our new birth, if you have been born again of water and of the Spirit, you have been raised together with Him. Ooh, yeah. And can I remind you that the blood of Jesus Christ washes away every single stain. The scars remain. Uh -huh. Come on. Come on. Uh, is it now God's fault? <clears throat> Can, can't, can't you just remove those from my mind? And how do you respond to the fact that you still have scars? Come on. Are you going to walk around with your hands in your pocket and hope nobody notices? Come on. I've, got, I've got scars. How many... Physically, I'm not talking about emotionally because that's none of my business. But how many have physical scars that you could point out to somebody? I've got some you're not going to see. I had chloric stenosis as a baby, so I got this big incision over here from 1965. And it was when I was newborn. I was projectile vomiting yards. and <laughs> They fixed it. I don't do that anymore. My wife said, really? <laughs> I've got I got one on this finger. It's almost gone. I was looking at it this morning, but it's almost gone. I got I, I one on on this finger. I won't lift that particular finger up toward you, but uh, I have one on this finger, and uh, it, it's the result of Nigeria when I was butchering a pig for our Bible school. My hand slid down the blade of, of the knife I was using, and being in Africa, you do what you do. You wrap it up and keep working. 
I've got one on this, this hand, and I've got several on this hand, but uh, i got one from an axe. Fine bonds. i got one from my daughter's bed that had steel uh, L brackets we had put and I reached under and, 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 and snagged. i got one in my knee that's probably just about gone from a chainsaw. Woo! So, and every scar has a story. Amen. Well, what you're going to do? You, you're just going to pretend that it didn't happen? You know, there's an interesting verse in James chapter 5, verse 16. And, and we shy away from this, but it, it says, confess your faults. Show people your scar. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, I think there's a fine line. I, I, Pastor, you can correct all this when, when I go. Wait till I know what it is. Think you're gonna correct it. <laughs> but, but I think there's a fine line between confessing our faults to one another in a godly way and giving the devil glory. Right, right. Amen. Th th this verse is not for you to say, man, I was, I was so bad out there. Here's, here's my list of all the raunchy things I did. That's not what this is talking about. Right. Right. Notice that this confession brings about healing. Right. Right. Note that when Thomas came in contact with the scars of Jesus, suddenly he believed. That's the truth. Right. That between Thomas's doubt and Thomas's faith, there was one thing that made all the difference in the world. And that was that he was permitted not only to see, but touch the scars in Jesus' body. And there's got to be something within us that, that understands that we are living in the midst of a lost and dying world. Something shocking to you, but here it is anyway. They're not looking for perfect people. Right. They're not looking for people right. that have their act all together, right. that never make a mistake, that never say the wrong thing, that never do anything out of sorts. They're looking for somebody who will walk into their lives and show them a few scars and say, No. gets up and starts talking about some stuff. Right. And, and, and you start thinking, oh, he's been nosing into my stuff. And, and he even, he heard a story about me and, and he's talking about things in my life and you don't understand that he's just trying to operate the Holy Ghost and, and speak as God has given to him. But, but we get our feathers all ruffled up because he, he's looking at, he's exposing, and he's even touching my I just want to remind you something you already know, but 
your scar is not going to get hurt if somebody touches it. Right. That's the truth. It's been healed. It's not going to get irritated. It's not going to get worse. It's not going to get aggravated. Come on. Come on. Yeah, that's good. Here it is. You touch it, no problem. Because it's a reminder. Look. Look. I said, look what the Lord. I'm not just going to tell you about it, but I got proof. Look what the Lord. transform the church into something that is so user friendly that it no longer resembles the house of God. Right. I, I'm just, that's me and again, you correct all this after I go if I'm messing up. But it was Jesus' humanity that made the difference to Thomas. That's right. Yes. Yes. And we're so afraid of people touching our humanity. Come on. In the Old Testament, it may have been the glory of God that healed Naaman's leprosy. But not so for you and I. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Now, if I mess with your theology, good. <laughs> But according to 1 Peter chapter 2 and 24, it's not the glory of God and the power of God that heals us. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to our sins should live in righteousness. By whose? Christ. Well, I thought it was the power of God that healed me. This is the word, and the word is actually quoted in the Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53. Yes. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. That it is in the darkest hour of Jesus' humanity that your healing was provided. In that reminder of the hurt and the pain and the difficulty and the rejection. beyond simply the words. I'm not telling you that you should walk out of here today and wallow in your self-pity and wallow in all the wrongs that have been done. But you need to understand there is a world that is out there. They are not going to find what they need if all they see is your perfect life and your perfect home and your pretend perfect situation. Because scars are wounds that have been healed, yes. that no longer hurt, 
that no longer provide pain and discomfort, but they do remind us of what we have been through. Jesus, in his wisdom, invited those who were his followers not only to see them, but to touch them. Amen. He could have chosen all kinds of ways to provide his healing. That's the truth. But he said, you're, you're going to get what you really need if you'll touch where I was wounded. We, we, we preach about it. We, we, we confess it. I, I've testified it and probably some of you have. And we've said something that goes a little bit like this. I want to be Jesus' hand. Come on. Come on. I want to be Jesus' feet. Oh. Come on. You better look at those hands. Come on. You better look at those feet. They're not perfect. They bear the scars of wounded humanity, of betrayal, of friends that turned their back in the time of need. But through it all, to those that are hungry, through it all, to those that are seeking, through it all, to those who are looking for an answer, those scars are the very things that provide salvation. Would you stand together with me in the house of the Lord? I don't pretend a whole lot to be enough at all like Jesus. It's a goal. Anybody here with me? Amen. It's a goal. But but like the Apostle Paul said, I have not yet attained that for which I was. I'm not there yet. It's the truth. But there's some things I can relate to of Jesus that I think he and I have in common. Rejected. Despised. Wounded in the house of friends. Not received by his own even public humiliation. While it may have been Jesus' perfection that made him our Lord, it is Jesus' wounds that make him our Savior and healer. We do not have a high priest that cannot be touched without the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without Amen. Anybody here got some scars? Amen. Amen. Yes. Oh, God wants to use you. Amen. Any, yes. Anybody willing to lift a hand and say, I've got some scars? Yes. Amen. So here am I, Lord, use me. Yes. If we could just take what the Lord has done for us individually to our world. We are going to see revival like never before. Amen. Amen. We can sit in, in a controlled environment like this and, and, and feel protected and feel safe. And, and, and here we can just put on our Sunday best and act our Sunday best and sing our Sunday best. But that is not going to work out there. Amen. Come on. And, and there's people here today. Some are young. Some are seasoned saints. But you are thinking that God can't use you because of your scars. Come on. That your scars have disqualified you somehow. That your scars, some of the abuse you've been through and, and some of the trauma you've been through and, and some of the hurt you've been through, that, that that's all working against you and, and you're therefore disqualified from ministry, you're disqualified from being used in the church and nobody is ever going to listen to you. When in reality, those things you have been through have actually been your preparation. Because God has healed you of that. Yes. God has forgiven you of that. Yes. He's put it up in the blood. It's in the past. And all things have become new right. in Jesus' name. Yes. Right. But there's somebody you're going to meet tomorrow. That's facing what you've got victory over. Come on. What an opportunity. I've got a scar. Will, 
Look what God has done. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 I know COVID prevents us maybe from gathering as we would, but I just feel in the Holy Ghost that there's some hurts. Come on. And there's even some scars. And, and there's a Spirit of God that is in this place that's trying to touch some young people and some husbands and some wives and, and, and even some call to ministry and, and trying to convince us that that scar does not qualify you and disqualify you. In fact, it qualifies you for unique opportunities of ministry in our lost and dying world. Could you just lift those hands toward heaven? Don't let those hurts slow you down. Don't let those wounds slow you down. Don't let your past keep you from the potential that God has for you. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's lift our voices right now. If, if Jesus can use his scars to convince an unbeliever, how much can God use your scars to equally convince an unbeliever? They're waiting for proof. They're waiting for somebody to come along to let them know that God actually understands where I'm at and you're the one. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Jesus, do you really
message today has identified some things for us. So many times we've got our Savior on such a pedestal. In the perfection of Jesus. He who knew no sin yet became sin for us and for the things that we face and whenever we see these hands our Savior's hands oh my it encourages me today to think so many people they are facing so much pain they face things that's happened in their life and they look back and they reminisce over those pains and they look over those things and, and struggle with them and struggle with them and just to know that our Savior, the pains that He took, yes. a spear in His side, nail prints in His hands and in His feet, to think for a moment, that perfect Example. That perfect example didn't leave unscarred. Today, this is an absolutely powerful message. If we if we have any way of, of being able to share that, I encourage you today. There's a lot of hurting people out there. There's a lot of people that they need to know. They need to know that they're the Savior. their wound and their scar is not going to keep them from being who they need to be in him i'm thankful today that as i look across here today i know that there is many of us we've suffered those scars some may be physical when we see those but there's others that we know we've endured and our hearts have been mended put back together i'm thankful today can we just ask the lord to let His Spirit minister to everyone joining us online. If they will know right now that there's a Savior who wants to touch their life. Jesus, we only come to You asking You right now, Lord God, to minister right now to every person, Lord, that could not make it today. Those, oh Lord, that they are away. We're asking You right now to touch their lives, to touch their spirit. We're asking, Lord, for You to mend, oh God, their hearts. Help them, Lord, to realize that the scars, oh Lord, that they have suffered. And Lord Jesus, they are your, your ability to give, Lord, a great witness, a great testimony, oh Lord, of your work. We ask you, Lord, to bless this day. Minister, oh God, for we rejoice in your goodness. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What an awesome, awesome presence of the Lord and an awesome message. This is one of those that deep call us to deep. And if you take this home in your spirit, there's going to be some things resonate in your life that God's going to do. Maybe it is that there's a spot that's not quite healed up yet. And the Lord's saying, guess what? It's just going to be a scar. It's just going to be a scar. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord for His great work. Aren't you glad today that we have such a wonderful Savior? He is touching our lives, changing our hearts, giving us life, and life more abundant. Amen, amen. Right now, we are, we are going to be uh, changing our order of service at the moment. And uh, we have uh, a, a baptismal candidate. And uh, this uh, this young lady is uh, going to be uh, getting prepared for uh, for uh, getting covered with Jesus. Amen. Amen. I could get a few of our guys, a few folks that are in that last row over there. If we could if we could kind of push some chairs forward and make room for folks to be able to to gather around. We're going to. Uh, we're going to move over into to that area. Oh, we got a happy birthday here going on. Happy birthday, Bobby. Happy birthday.
birthday, Bella. Hi. Happy birthday, Brooke Scott.